Good morning, saints, and welcome to our Sunday morning Bible class for this fourth Sunday after the Epiphany. Uh, saints, we are glad this time to be having the Bible class actually in the sanctuary. So I'm very glad to, uh, to have you with us today on this beautiful day which the Lord has given us. So let us now turn our hearts to the Word of God and first of all in prayer. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. O oh Lord, we thank you for your holy word. We thank you, dear Lord, that through your words you give us the truth of your gospel. And you also teach us how to interact with each other as Christians and with the world. We ask now, O oh God, that you would give us wisdom and understanding as we learn from the Apostle Peter, who, teach, who taught the people of that age and continues to teach throughout the ages as being a teacher of the church about false teachers. Teach us, dear Lord, today. Help us to learn and to apply it to our daily lives of witness in your church. And now, God, I pray that you would give me wisdom of uh, interpret or accuracy of interpretation and clarity of speech. In Jesus' holy name, amen. So, saints, this morning, if you will open up your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 2, 2 Peter chapter 2. Now, what is 2 Peter chapter 2 all about? Well, 2 Peter chapter 2, uh, the, uh, the specific theme is false teachers, where Peter speaks about false teachers in the church and who they are, what they act like, and what they do. But he also says what will happen to them. And so this morning, we're going to look at false teachers and what Peter has to say about them. Specifically, reviewing the chapter, Peter, after establishing the basics of our Christian faith, his own credibility as a teacher of the church and the prophecies of scripture, he proceeds to refute or reject the teachings of the false prophets with truth and directness. We must know that the false teachers will be among us and always be among us. And the only way to overcome them is by the power of the Holy Spirit as the Spirit opens our eyes and shows us the word of God. Peter begins by attacking their false teachings and then denounces the false teachers themselves. He assures his readers of the impending doom of all those who take the word of God and misuse it for their own purposes. And also he speaks about how those who continue in the truth have eternal life. So saints, let's now turn our hearts and our thoughts and eyes to 2 Peter chapter 2. Peter begins by writing, but they were also false prophets among the people. When he says this, saints, he's referring to, when he says also, he was referring to those times in the past. In the ages, there were false teachers. And as there are false teachers, then there will be teachers now. He said, even as there will be false teachers among you, those in his time and in ours who will secretly bring destructive heresies. Now, destructive heresies, these are where these false teachers will give you some of the truth, but not all the truth, and they will blend it. They will take some of that truth and blend it with the errors that they teach. He says that uh, they will bring these destructive heresies even to denying the Lord who, they who brought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. They will contradict, they will reject, disavow the teachings of Christ, and as a result, they would be swiftly dealt with. They will, that God's punishment, his destruction will be swift and terrible. That's this, of course, they don't repent. Verse two, Peter writes, and many will follow their destructive ways. Isn't that interesting, saints? That there will be many 
many within the church because they don't know the word of God. That's why we're here to learn it. Many within the church who will be taken away, who will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. You see, will be slandered, will be uh, exploited, destroyed because they've taken the word of God and these false teachers twist it for people's liking and for their purpose. Verse 33, he says, now he's giving a description of these false teachers. And by covetousness, that means they like money, okay? They like power. By covetousness, they will exploit you, okay? They'll make merchandise of you, saints, if you follow with deceptive words, okay? Deceptive words, words that are easy, sweet in your mouth, and words you want to hear, whose judgment for a long time has not been idle. God said from the beginning they would be destroyed, and their destruction does not slumber. Unless they repent, that destruction is, what, that destruction is waiting for them. And verse 4 through 7 Peter gives examples from the past. In other words, God didn't, didn't accept it then. He destroyed false prophets in the past. We see it in the Old Testament. He will deal with them in Peter's time and with ours. It says in verse 4, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, you know, the ones who uh, allied themselves with Satan. Remember, God gives all of his creation. He gives all of them a choice. It says, but cast them down to hell and deliver them into the chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. In other words, God did not spare the angels. He certainly will not spare the false prophets of that age and ours. He goes on to say in five, and did not spare the ancient world, but save Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. God did not spare the wicked of Noah's days. Remember that, saints, things were so bad that God regretted even creating mankind, but he looked upon Noah and saw that Noah was righteous. Okay, and so he saved Noah. That lets us know that when God, when the end of the world comes, those who are wicked will be destroyed, but those who are righteous through Christ will have eternal life. And remember those of the older ages before Christ came, they were saved because they believed in the promises of God. They believed in the promise of a Messiah. And in verse 6, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, another example of God's judgment upon unbelief, into ashes, condemning them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterwards would live ungodly. If God would certainly deal with the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, with the people of the age of Noah, with the angels, he will certainly take care of or deal with those false prophets who in in, in the age of Peter and in our age, deceive God's people, thinking they can get away with it. And then he went on in verse 7, it says, And delivered Lot, who was oppressed with the filthy conduct of the wicked. It means that, that uh, Lot was distressed. He was worn out by all the evil that he saw in Sodom and Gomorrah. Because remember that Abraham had given him a choice of pasture land. Well, he chose one by the big city. And as a result, he got caught up in it himself. But he was still a righteous man. He did not get caught up in their behavior. And he was troubled by it. But we see here he delivered righteous lot. In other words, the Lord knows how to rescue godly people while at the same time punishing the wicked. We are told when the Lord comes that he will separate, he will separate the righteous from the wicked. And in verse 8 he goes on to say, re uh, referring to Lot, for that righteous man Lot dwelling among them, meaning the unrighteous of Sodom and Gomorrah, was tormented, he was tortured, his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their unlawful deeds. We see it all around us, saints. That's why we have to plead to the Lord for mercy. 
And in verse 9, the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of, its, out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. In other words, God knows how to, how to separate the righteous from the wicked. Never think that God has given up on us who believe and trust in him. No, the righteous will not perish with the wicked, but we must pray for the wicked because what, for the grace of God, there go I. Amen. Verse 10, and especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness, okay, and despite and despise authority, they are presumptuous, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. These are the ones who reject authority. They will not submit to God or man. They do what they want to do when they want to do it not realizing that destruction awaits them. And that's what these false prophets do. They pay, tell people what they want to hear. They promote themselves. They make the money. They get the power. They get the authority. But at the same time, God has reserved punishment for them if they don't repent. And it says in 11, whereas angels who are greater in power and might do not bring a reviling accusation against them before the Lord. Even angels don't do these kind of evil things that evil people do. Amen. Verse 12, and they have more power than a mere person. Verse 12, but these, meaning these false prophets, these ungodly, like natural brute beasts, made to be caught and destroyed, speak evil of the things they do not understand and will utterly perish in their own corruption. They speak evil of the things of the spirit. They misuse the word of God. They twist the word of God. They abuse the word of God to get you and me to go along with them for their own selfish purposes. And they will face judgment for it. You know, saints, even preachers of the gospel, myself, we have a double judgment. God will certainly judge us as human beings, as sinners, but he'll also judge us as pastors. We have to be careful what we tell you and others because we're not only supposed to carry, uh, wear the cross, we're supposed to carry it and we have the obligation. The same obligation as you, but more so as teachers. And uh, verse 13, and will receive the wages of unrighteousness as those who count it pleasure to carouse in the daytime. They are spots and blemishes, carousing in their own deceptiveness while they feast with you. They are disgraceful persons. They just give in to the flesh and do what the flesh wants them to do. That's why Peter writes they're like beasts. At least an animal does what it does by instinct. They don't really think. That's why they're not really judged the way we are, okay? Because they're by instinct, they're instinctive. They've been corrupted. <laughs> That's why the lion doesn't lie with the lamb until after the Lord Jesus comes. But we have, God has given us a thinking minds and a free will, amen? Verse 14, having eyes full of adultery, they go after the flesh and they cannot cease from sin, beguiling unsta unstable souls. So they use gullible people for their own gratification. It says here, they have a heart trained in covetous practices and are accursed children. They commit evil in the eyes of God and of people, and they stand accursed, they stand punishment. Once again, if they do not repent, and uh, verse 15, they have forsaken the right way and have gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of righteousness. He had evil motives, and he even was told to curse Israel, and he was going to do that when God spoke through his donkey to stop him. He still didn't stop his evilness and ended up being killed with all those who opposed the, uh, the children of Israel, to who opposed Israel. And in verse 16, but he was rebuked for his iniquity, a dumb donkey speaking with a man's voice restrained the madness of the prophet. Only God working through this donkey checked him, meaning he kept kicking the donkey to move it to where he wanted to go, but the donkey would not move. God spoke through the donkey, okay? And that lets us know that God has power over evil. And verse 17, 
These, meaning these wicked people, these false prophets, these are wells without water, meaning they have no purpose or function in life. They are clouds carried by a, t by a tempest. They're clouds that are moved by wind, to whom the gloom of darkness is reserved forever. If they don't quit, they will face eternity away from God and will be driven by Satan. Verse 18. For when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, that's how they get people. People are swayed by words. They're swayed by the way they look. All these things instead of seeing through the eyes of God. They allure through the lust of the flesh, through licentiousness, those who have actually escaped from those who live in error. And these are those who believed in God at one time, knew the truth, but they let the words of the evil ones, Satan working through them, shift them from the truth to the ways of the flesh. 19, and while they promised them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption as they bring those of us who turn from God, as they bring us into that mess, they themselves are caught in the same mess. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. The promised freedom that they promise others, they themselves are a slave of sin as well. So Peter is talking about, saints, the effect of following a false prophet. Verse 20, he goes on to say, For is if after they, meaning those who once believed, were caught up in unbelief, following a false prophet, have escaped the pollutions of this world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They knew God. They are again entangled in them and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning because they knew and rejected God. It was worse for them than if they had never known God at all. And verse 21, for it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. You see, it was worse to them because they knew Jesus. They knew, they believed and trusted in him, but they must not have known him as they should. Because we know that those who truly believe in God, the Lord says, no one, I have written your name on the palm of my hand and no one will snatch you from my hand. So we, we see here that God separates those who believe and those who do not. And the end for the ungodly, the end for the false prophet is a horrible end. Finally, in verse 22, speaking of those who supposedly knew Christ and in turn from him, he writes, finally, Peter says, but it has happened to them according to the true proverb, the dog returns to his own vomit and the sow that has, has had washed or the sow that had washed to her wallowing in the mire. They had the faith and they returned to wickedness. So saints, we see here how Peter speaks to us about the false prophet. What the false prophet is like, what the false prophet does, and what the false prophet does to those who follow him or her. So what are the lessons that we learn from our brother and fellow apostle and teacher, the Apostle Peter. I have about five lessons for us. There are plenty more in this text, but these are things just to get us to think about. The first, saints, is when it comes to anyone preaching or teaching you, carefully watch their walk, their walk, the way they live, not just the way they sound in church, but watch their walk, and their talk, okay? They may say certain things, but watch out for them. See how they live. You see, Peter tells us that even a person who has what appears to be a godly way of life or walk and a relationship with Jesus Christ can still bring in destructive heresies. Don't let, don't let what you think of a person, or how a person looks, or how a person appears, lead you in the wrong direction. 
Oftentimes, good people who teach lies do the worst damage. Their lies are accepted far more easily because of their good character of these people. Be sure to observe their ways and lives, their words and actions. Amen. Amen. You notice in the Bible, it doesn't describe how Jesus looks. So we wouldn't be attracted to him by anything purely physical. It was his words and his actions that were in line with the word of God because he is God. He is a son of God. So the first thing, watch out for false prophets. Don't go by the surface. Look beneath it. Second, many Christians will be misled by the false teachers among us. Many saints, but well, the scriptures tell us that the road to heaven is narrow, isn't it? Filled with thorns and thistles, it's unpaved. Whereas the road to hell is wide and broad and paved. This goes in line with that. Peter warns us that many will follow their destructive ways. This reminds us that false teachers are popular. Just because something succeeds in attracting or someone succeeds in attracting a crowd of followers, it doesn't mean that it is of God's word or that it is of God. We know that God's work will always bear fruit. Yes, it will. But the devil's work can also increase. However, the most distracted, distressing aspect of the work of false teachers is not that they are among us. The most distracting fact is that so many Christians will follow their destructive ways. So remember that, saints. They will always be among us. That's why you got to watch them. Third lesson, God will destroy the wicked, yet rescue the righteous. Make sure you're on the right side, saints. The preservation and deliverance of Lot in the Bible gave the apostle occasion to remark that God knew as well to save as to destroy and that his goodness led him as forcibly to save righteous Lot as his justice did to destroy the rebellious in the instances of the angels, the people of Noah's day, and also of Sodom and Gomorrah. So that's the next thing. God knows how to save, but don't think that God's a punk, that he won't punish evil, unrepented evil. God's not a sap. He's not a pushover. But God does love, and he will give us every opportunity. So, saints, be very careful about who you listen to. Know your word. Apply your word. And don't be led by someone or anyone that what they say sounds good, but what they're saying, is it in line with God's word? Because God certainly will save. He's strong to save, but he will punish. Our next lesson, you will know the ungodly by their fruits. That's very similar to our other lesson. Peter gives his readers the characteristics of false prophets and all ungodly. In other words, you should know the characteristics of a false prophet. Scriptures say you will know the false prophets by their fruits. You see, they are first of all fleshly and proud. They're proud and fleshly, okay? They function in the flesh, not the spirit. They are like animals, and they follow it, and they find ways to justify the way they want to live. And in most cases, they're living like the world, and they use that to justify their own Christ, their unchristian living, although they claim to be Christian. They are a dangerous and corrupting presence in the body of Christ because they deceive other people. They appeal to the flesh. We have to understand that the Christian walk is not an easy one, that God tells us we have to say no to the flesh, no to our bodies, because our bodies will lead us down the Pam Primrose path. But the false prophet will tell you there's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong if you do this, nothing wrong if you do that. But that's not what the word of God says. Their heart is set on the flesh with their eyes on adultery. They are both spiritual adulterers and that they have left God and they are sexually adulterers. They want to please their bodies instead of pleasing God's. And they will use you 
as a way of getting their fulfillment. They prey on the unstable, those who are not stable in their faith, to join them in their ways. And they are equipped, but not for ministry, but for the selfish gain. And they are truly a curse. They know how to use and abuse people to speak the right words, to do the right things. And they use their bodies as well to do it. And finally, our last lesson is that those who follow false prophets become slaves of corruption and bondage. Now here's the ironic part as well, that those who lead us into this type of life are themselves slaves to corruption and bondage. You see the messages or the message of the ungodly false teacher is empty of real spiritual content. Though it is swollen big with words, okay, with words, because words influence people so much instead of us just stopping and think. That's why they tell you when you are in a theater and there's a fire, you don't yell fire. You slowly get up and evacuate the building. Their allure is to the lust of the flesh in their audience. Yes, you can have that money. Yes, you can have that power. Yes, you can have that woman, although she's married to another man. Yes, you can have that man, although he's married to another woman. Yes, you can be intimate outside of marriage. Yes, you can do what you want to do with others who are like you. There's so many different things you can do, and they tell you it's okay. But that's not what the world says. And by the way, saints, we have all sinned. I'm a sinner. We all sin in thought, word, and deed. I'm not saying these things, saints, to uh, attack anyone but to say that God will punish these things if unrepented. You see, they promise you freedom, freedom. You see, there are lures to the lusts of the flesh in their audience, just as the crowds who wanted bread from Jesus, but didn't want Jesus himself. They promise freedom, but freedom can never be found in the flesh, saints, only in God's spirit. Freedom isn't found in what Jesus can give us, but only in Jesus himself. When we seek freedom in the wrong way, we become slaves of corruption, decay, and death. In being overcome by the flesh and the false teachers, those unfortunates become slaves to both. So saints, these are the things that Peter wishes to share with us today. I trust and pray that these words have touched your heart. I pray you've taken notes to learn them. From now on, uh, we will have our Bible study as best I can here in the sanctuary. Here in the sanctuary, we're understanding that one day we will stand in the sanctuary of God, all of us. Until then, we have to remember that we're still within the sanctuary. You notice. Sanctuary here at St. Philip and a lot of sanctuaries are built just like an ark that will take us over the waters of judgment. So saints today, make yourself right with God. I mean, you can't, you can't make yourself right with God, but if you're not living as you should, or if you've been listening to someone who's been lying to you, turn from those ways and turn to God. I ask you, saints, as I tell the people here at St. Philip all the time, that if there's anything I've said to you that is contrary to the word, please bring it to my attention. It's so very important, saints, that you know the word so that you can refute the false prophets and so you won't be taken in by them. And so, saints, may God bless you this day. I pray you stay with us and you listen to our sermon taken from the Gospel of Matthew entitled, Forgiving by Nature. Because during this season of epiphany in which Jesus shone forth through, through, his, uh, uh, through his baptism, how he, he showed forth through uh, the transfiguration, the visit of the uh, wise men, uh, that we ourselves will show forth his light to others. And one of the ways is forgiving those who have hurt us, remembering that God forgave us who hurt him very badly and continue to do so, he still forgives us. So saints also remember that we are still having in-person 
worship here in St. Philip. We've been doing so since May of last year. Please continue to pray that the Lord remove COVID from among us. And please remember to be continued to be strong in faith. Pray for us as we pray for you. Uh, God is a great and loving God, and he won't leave or forsake us. Next week, we'll look at 2 Peter chapter 3. So saints, receive the Lord's blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine among you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Go now in the peace and joy of the Lord. And saints, I hope to see you shortly for our message.